we're going to switch gears a little bit now and go into a tumor type that we've never really discussed here on Peer Exchange, but I think it's becoming, there's, a, there's lots of great studies. There's, again, more new drugs coming onto the market. And obviously, for, for the urology uh, team here, it's, it's, it's something that we obviously see a lot, and I think it's a, it's a, real, uh, uh, a real potential here uh, again, as we as we see uh, more and more patients that present with hematuria and ultimately bladder cancer, so as we as we all know, there there tends to be two basic types of bladder cancer: non-muscle invasive and muscle invasive bladder cancer. So this first case we're going to go through is a 53-year-old white female who presents to her primary care physician with pelvic and flank pain, as well as microscopic hematuria. As is oftentimes done in, in, in the community and elsewhere, she was treated with antibiotics by the PCP, continued to have tumor, too numerous to count red cells on high power field, has no history of kidney stones, is a non-smoker, works at a local boot factory in Middle Tennessee, is sexually active, and no prior surgical history. After she failed and continued to have blood in her urine, she was sent to urology, they went ahead and did a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis, which showed left hydroureteronephrosis, thickening of the left lateral wall of the bladder, and a questionable two centimeter lymph node to the left common iliac uh, artery. She underwent cystoscopy under local anesthesia, and it showed a non-papillary tumor to the left lateral wall and hemitrigone. Orifice was not identified, and examination uh, otherwise was unremarkable. She was then taken for general anesthesia, had a biopsy which showed high-grade urothelial carcinoma with invasion deep into the muscularis, and her EUA uh, basically showed that her bladder was not fixed. So we've got a young woman, healthy, non-smoker, left hydro, thickening of the left bladder wall, orifice is not identified, non-papillary tumor, broad-based, high-grade urothelial cancer, with at least invasion uh, into the superficial and probably deep muscularis, at least a T2, T3 disease. So, Dr. Cookson. Well, there's a couple of things about her that are interesting, and I, I think it's been reported in lung cancer, a higher incidence of non-smoking related. I think we're seeing that in bladder too. Yep. Um, in this particular lady, she has hydronephrosis. That's a harbinger of poor outcome, usually related to uh, late in discovery, also associated with lymphadenopathy. Most of the time, these patients have no obvious radiographic evidence. This lady does. So I think there are many things about her features that make us think she has systemic risk and may already have regional nodes. So I would, even if she didn't have the node, I would be in favor of suggesting platinum-based neoadjuvant chemotherapy up front for her. Um, the uh, challenge will be what's her renal function with an obstructed kidney, and she may, because we can't get in from below, need a nephrostomy tube to allow for her to get the renal function she needs to get the therapy that she needs. So let's just say her creatinine's 1.1. They, they go ahead and put a left percutaneous nephrostomy tube. So Dan, uh, I, I think this is an area where Historically, urologists, I think we're getting better, uh, but we've not necessarily always embraced the concept of, of neoadjuvant right. chemotherapy right. for muscle invasive bladder cancer. So we have two randomized trials which have demonstrated a survival benefit for neoadjuvant platinum-based chemotherapy. The two studies that, uh, the two regimens used in that study were, were either MVAC uh, in the United States or in Europe it was CMV, and this shows about a 10% overall uh, difference or improvement in overall survival in favor of systemic chemotherapy. So um, we recommend neoadjuvant cisplatinum-based therapy routinely for those patients who have adequate renal function uh, prior to a cystectomy. So cisplatinum, what if they have poor renal function? How, how does CARBO do in, uh, in this well, setting? The trouble is there's no data with CARBO, and there are a lot of us who feel that CARBO is an inferior drug to cisplatinum. So we'll try to make every effort to manipulate uh, the cisplatinum dosage or schedule to get that full treatment in. So for example, you can split the platinum over two different days. Uh, you can do other little tricks to try to keep the creatinine cr clearance uh, uh, up. Uh, but cisplatinum should be used at all costs if 
uh, a patient has creatinine of 2, for example, I would just go right to cystectomy. I would not even bother with carboplatin-based therapy.